I want to start by telling you my story. I know you've heard a lot of my stories, but I don't often share kind of the macro journey that I've had with God. And I want to start today with that story. I was uh, saved at age six, 1989. Uh, remember it very clearly, probably one of my two earliest childhood memories. I remember praying and asking Jesus to come into my heart, my mother by my bedside, and I remember meaning it, very much meaning it. Uh, don't tell me that kids cannot pray to receive Jesus. Uh, most people who accept Christ do it in their childhood. That's why we put so much effort and intentionality into our student and kids' ministries, because it's the most fertile moment. And that was true for me. I accepted Christ at age six and very much meant it and lived my life as a Christian to the best of my ability. But I found, especially as I hit my teen years, my ability was not that good. Uh, my ability to live the Christian life was a struggle. I would even call it a bit of a war, uh, a war of identity, not quite sure who I am and, and what my purpose is and what I should be, uh, a war of morality, never really being able to, for very long, hold up the standard that I knew God was calling me to. Has anybody ever experienced that? Like, you know, here's what God says his people are supposed to do and how they're supposed to live and walk, and then your ability to kind of meet that line just falls very short. I found that in my life. I, I noticed a war of security, or I would call it insecurity. Uh, not really sure not only who I am, but I could totally resonate with the, the testimony we watched earlier of Lisa Robertson just saying, I never really knew for sure if I belonged to God or if I was saved. And I, I can remember literally hundreds of times Dozens of times in church and hundreds of times in my own personal life, just asking again, Jesus, come into my heart and save me because I don't feel like if I die today, I'm going to go to heaven and live forever in your presence. I just was never sure that I was in. I don't know if you can relate to that. And then just a war of vitality, you know, reading the, the, the promises of God in the scripture and the, the promise of fullness of life and always being satisfied and yet in my life, never quite satisfied and not feeling the fullness of life. And this battle went on in my life uh, for the duration of my childhood, adolescence, and even into my young adulthood. In 2001, I graduated high school and went to St. Thomas University for my first year of university. And it was there that I really started to lose the battle in like profound ways. And I found myself early in the winter of 2002 with a kind of a crisis of faith where I knew I had to make a decision to turn in the direction of God, that I wasn't on the path I was supposed to be on. And so I did all that a good church kid knows how to do when it comes to repenting. It means do the opposite of what you're currently doing. And so I was at St. Thomas, and, okay, I'm gonna go to Bible college and try to get my life in order. And so that's what I did. I didn't go to Bible college because I thought I was gonna be in ministry. I went there to kind of get my life reset. And fortunately for me, when I did go there, I encountered a God that I never knew. And I, my faith in Jesus deepened. And who I believed him to be took a new 3D kind of richness in my life. And yet the battle still raged on, maybe more so than ever. In 2005, uh, I was nearing the end of my time at Bible college. And part of the the, the training, I had decided I was going to go into ministry at that time. And part of the training was that you had to go and spend six months uh, learning in a church context from pastors. And so I got the invitation. Now I look back on it and I see it's the sovereign hand of God. But I got the invitation along with Pastor Seth in Halifax to go to a little church, not a little church, a big church in a little town uh, in Presque Isle, Maine. This church had been experiencing just a mighty move of God, and we all knew about it. And the door opened for me to go there and learn and be around these people. And when I got there, the evidence of their lives and the fruitfulness of their lives was just something I'd never seen before. There was a power and a joy and a peace and an identity and a self-awareness and a spirit awareness that I'd never experienced. And I got there and immediately felt like whatever they have, I want that. And it wasn't a few weeks into my time there, late summer, Pastor Rick got up and he started the series, much like what we're going to do here in the month of June. And he taught on the Holy Spirit and he got up and he shared in his message and he said this, that you were meant for the presence of the Holy Spirit in and on your life and that you can't actually live the Christian life without the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in you and on you. 
And then he went a step further and he said, it's probable in a context as large as this that there are many of you who need a refill of the Holy Spirit because you've gone months, maybe years, maybe decades without having a fresh touch from God. It's probable that many people need a refill because we leak. And then he goes and he says it one step further, it's actually possible that there are a lot of you here who have lived your life as a believer in Jesus, but you've never actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that hit my pride, that hit my insecurity, that hit my fear, because I've been a Christian for decades at this point, or at least like 18 years, and you're telling me that I've not experienced something? I've done more church than most kids, and yet... There was something rattling, some kind of beyond my intimidation. There was an invitation of the Spirit inside of me that said, I want this for you, and you've not experienced what he's talking about. And so it created this hunger inside of me as I had this realization that I was not full of the Holy Spirit, that I was empty and my life was void of the power that it needs to really experience the promise of God in my life. I couldn't honestly say that I'd ever experienced what Pastor Rick was talking about. I listened with a combination of anxiety and desire for the next few weeks as Rick taught about the Holy Spirit and posed the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? He showed biblically how there is a work that the Spirit does in our lives to bring us into belief in Jesus. The work of salvation is a work of the Spirit. I'll show you that in a minute. But he also talked that there's this second mighty work that God does when the Spirit actually falls upon us and fills us from the inside out and gives us his power and presence to live the Christian life. And he went on to explain and show in the Bible how Jesus promised this and how it was evidenced at Pentecost when the believers, they were believers, who went and they waited and they had this season of waiting and seeking and then the Spirit fell upon them. We see it evidenced in the letters of Paul. And Rick taught us this, how, you know, the church in Ephesus, they put their faith in Jesus, but they were all mixed up on what the baptisms were. And so they were baptized in Jesus' name. And then it tells us that Paul went and laid hands on them and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this this other mighty work in their lives. He talked about John Wesley, the story of John Wesley and how he'd been a believer for decades. And then one time he was on this ship in stormy seas and he saw these people called the Moravians who had a peace that nobody else had. And he realized there was some version of their faith that they have that I don't have. And he went on this season of seeking. And then the story goes, he was in this little chapel by himself and the spirit of God fell on him. And he said, my heart was strangely warm. And I listened and I listened and I got hungrier and hungrier to experience that in my life. And so I went on a journey and in October of 2005 at a Bible camp in Browns Flats, Beulah Camp, uh, there surrounded by a group of men, I sat down in a chair and I said, God, whatever you have for me, I want you. And his spirit fell on me. in a way that I had never experienced. And it, is not, it was not the same as just being in a room where you were moved. There was something different and deeper about what God did in that moment. And my life since then, I would say I have battles, but the war has been won. I know who I am. I have never asked God to save me again. I know whose I am. And he has given me increasing victory in my life. I am not the same. There are things I used to struggle with and be bound to that I am free from. This is what happens when the Spirit fills you. And my life has been a series of filling and emptying and then filling in greater measure and then stretching and emptying and then filling in greater measure. I experienced it in 2012-13. I experienced a refilling in 2016. And I experienced a refilling just a little over a week ago. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But I want this for you. But more than that, King's Church, God wants this for you. Whether you have been filled or not, we all need a refill or a first fill. And that's what we're going to do. This is the truth I want you to hear this morning. And I hope it just starts to stir up an appetite. But there is nothing more that God wants to do for you than give you more of him. 
Let that sit for a second. There is nothing more that God wants to do for you than give you more of him. And here, here, here's what I'll put in tandem with that. There is nothing more that you want than more of him. You just might not know it yet. See, you think you want to raise. You think you want control. You think you want satisfaction. But everything you are ultimately looking for is found in the person and presence of God in the Holy Spirit. And I want to spend a few minutes, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you've been, to invite you to experience the life and joy and vitality that only comes from having his presence abide in you and you in him. God wants this for your life. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Next week, we're going to talk about what happens when the Spirit comes. Then we're going to talk about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of this season, we're going to just pray and ask God to come and fill us. And he's going to do that. He might do it then and there. It might be when you hit the parking lot. It might be a few days beyond that. But we know when we ask, he gives. And I'll talk about that in the coming moments. But here's what I want to do today really quickly. And we're going to motor If you want more deep theological stuff, uh, we have some more deep and in-depth teaching on who the Holy Spirit is on our YouTube channel. But I want to hit these things for us today. I want to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the problem or our problem with the Holy Spirit, and the promise of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about who is the Holy Spirit. Let's get into that. Are you with me? Do you feel something stirring in your heart? I hope you do. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, put... Put succinctly, the Holy Spirit is God. Now let's just like, can I do this? Because I know at our church, and we're we're blessed in this. We've got Catholics and Charismatics. We've got Baptists and Old Presbyterians. And we've got everything, cactists and all the stuff, right? Just, that's a church joke, a cactus. We've got everything. And you have baggage and stuff. But let's just like zoom out and just say, God... According to your word, would you speak to me and teach me about your spirit? So the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. This is not some like side version of like heavenly things. It's not just some, it's not God's pet. This is God. I know sometimes we get thinking about the Holy Spirit because of our upbringing perhaps, or maybe even further than this, I think the devil works very hard to distort and downplay the, the validity and the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit so that we don't experience him. But a lot of the time we think of the Holy Spirit like in the, in the family of God, he's the crazy uncle, you know? But that is, not, that is not what the Bible tells us. The Holy Spirit is God. Now, if we have more time, I get into the, Trini- the Trinity and the idea, that, the biblical idea that God is three persons, three distinct persons in one. God is one and three. I know it's a paradox, but it's true. God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. They are one and they are three. And they are equal in value uncreated and equal in value. And it's very important that we stress that when we get talking about the Holy Spirit. Because if you're like me, you easily get putting the Spirit in a different category. There's like God the Father Almighty, Elohim, El Shaddai, the Lord Most High. And there's Jesus the Son who we all love and we all get. But then that Holy Spirit, man, there's a little, not sure. But the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, is God. So he being God, stay with me, has all of the same attributes that God has. God is sovereign, so the Spirit is sovereign. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, creative. He's power. He is love. He's he's eternal. He's holy. He's almighty. He's merciful. He's compassionate. The Holy Spirit is glorious. He's beautiful. This is the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit like? Well, he's exactly like the Father, And this will help some of you who get nervous when we get talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus. They are the same. They are the same. So so none of us would be afraid of Jesus. Well, Jesus is so merciful and kind and selfless. So is the Holy Spirit. They are the same. The Holy Spirit is God. But, or along with that, the Holy Spirit is spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. What do I mean by that? He's not material. He's spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is not material. However, he is very legitimate. How many of you know there are things in our lives, even in this world, that although they are immaterial, they are very real? You're under the effects of gravity. You're under the effects of wind. This is why Jesus described the Holy Spirit like the wind. Very real, very powerful. You can see his evidence. It's evidence, but it's not material. And the Spirit of God is spirit, not matter. And this is why we struggle sometimes because we, we overvalue the five senses, don't we? But the spirit isn't, isn't perceived with your eyes. It says in 1 Corinthians, the natural person doesn't accept the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned. And so we need a different way to discern the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus said in John 14, he said the world cannot receive him because they're not looking for him. They're looking for him with their eyes, but he's spiritually discerned. So the Holy Spirit is spirit. Also, though, and this is really, really important, the Holy Spirit is a person, is a person. Now, why do I stress that? This is where a lot of us run into problems when we think about the Holy Spirit, because we think about him maybe as a force or as a feeling, but he's not a force. The Holy Spirit is a he. The Spirit is not an it. Very important that you get the personality of the Holy Spirit. We aren't talking about some abstract concept. He is not the force, Star Wars fans. Just, just honest confession. Have you ever tried to use the force? It's a safe place. I have. <laughs> Even if you could use the force, and there were midi-chlorians around, uh, that is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is also not a feeling. It's not emotion. It's not even the feeling of being overwhelmed. Although feelings come with the Holy Spirit, they are evidence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not feeling. The Holy Spirit is also not the personification of God. He's not the personification of God. He's not like uh, the Jack Frost or Santa Claus. That's not, he, he is a person. He's not luck. He's not karma. He's not the Tao. He's not yin and yang. He is a person. He is God. The Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a personality. He has a will. He can be insulted. He can be lied to. He can be grieved. The Holy Spirit has emotions. He can be resisted. The Holy Spirit is a person. You got it? So who's the Holy Spirit? He's God, he is spirit, and he is a person. Now what does the spirit do? The spirit, first and foremost, is working, even right now as I speak, to do all these things, but he starts with revealing truth. He is the spirit of illumination, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what Paul prayed in 1 Thessalonians. He says, I pray that you receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray that, that the spirit of God would open your eyes to perceive how high and how wide and how deep is the love of Christ Jesus. The spirit's primary role, Jesus even said this when he told his disciples, when, when the spirit comes, he's going to lead you into all, into all truth. His primary job is to open our eyes to remove the lies and allow us to see the truth. And so ultimately, do you want to know what the Holy Spirit is working to do? He's getting us to see, love, and adore Jesus Christ. His work is that we would love the Son and that we would see the Son of God and that we would adore the Son of God. His Spirit works to draw us to Jesus. This is what the Spirit does. And so for, for a church, if you want to be part of a Holy Spirit church, which we are and which you are if you're part of this church, one of the primary ways to know the Holy Spirit is at work is if Jesus is being loved more and celebrated more and adored more. The Spirit is most active when Jesus is being focused on and adored and obeyed and loved. So the Spirit works to reveal truth. The Spirit also brings transformation. This, this, this word sanctification or change. It's the Spirit's work in us that makes us like Jesus. This is why for 
over a decade as a child and as a teenager and as a young adult, I tried and tried and tried to be like Jesus, but I kept failing and falling short. Anybody know the struggle? But when the Spirit of God fills a person, you start in this journey of transformation. It is a journey. I don't want to get up here and say, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I've arrived. Oh, no. God continues to change and transform me. But when the Spirit fills you and the Spirit starts to work in your life, you start to see the gradual but unmistakable shift of who you are. You start to be less like you and more like Jesus. This is what the Spirit does. He produces fruit in your life. It's the byproduct of knowing Jesus through the Holy Spirit that you are a person who is filled with increasing joy, kindness, love, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what the Spirit does. See, there's a myth that's surrounded Christianity, and it is a lie of the devil. And let's just call it out for what it is. Look, being a Christian is not about, you know, making bad people better. It's about making dead things alive, and when the spirit of life comes into us, we start to come to life. And so, for instance, if if today I was preaching a message on joy, and I said, you know what, God wants you to be joyful, and you left here thinking, well, I better be more joyful, you can't, right? Or I preached a message on, on being unafraid that that God, Jesus said, do not worry, so you can't have anxiety. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go and be less anxious. How many of you can't do that? You can't fabricate it. But when the Spirit fills you, he gives you peace. He gives you self-control. So so here's the solution. Like if you ever come to church and you, you hear God calling you to a standard, you don't pray, God, give me more joy. You pray, God, give me more of your spirit that produces joy. Or, God, give me more of your spirit that produces peace. If you're anxious today, don't ask God for peace. Ask for his presence, and in his presence you have peace. Very important that we get this. If you're you're a person who struggles with addiction, a better prayer than God break my addiction is, God, inhabit me, invade me, fill me more with your presence, because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So addiction can't hang out where the spirit is. You understand? So our prayer and our focus is very simple. It's it's just more of you, God, in my life. More of you in my life. And as that happens, I have more peace and joy and kindness and gentleness. This is what happens. He transforms us and he empowers us. He brings us to life. The spirit is the present power of God flowing in us, filling us, and empowering us to live the Christian life. Jesus never intended for you to be like him by yourself. You can't. But with the spirit, we have comfort and peace and wisdom and knowledge and equipping and gifts and freedom and power and satisfaction and assurance that we're saved. This is what the spirit does. So in A nutshell, what does the Spirit do? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give us real life. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is given to us to give us real life. The Spirit of God is the well of real, lasting, fulfilling life. He is the singular source to the empowered, transforming, enhancing, enduring. I just couldn't stop writing stuff. Life Jesus bought for us and the Father wants for us. I hope even as I talk, there's something inside of you, an appetite that's increasing. It says, God, I want more of your Spirit in my life. This is the primary thing that God wants. This really is the gospel. You know that? The gospel is not just Jesus died for my sins so I can go to heaven someday. Like, let's, let's just really quick, let's plot out the timeline of the gospel and, and how this all works. In the beginning, it says God made man in his image. And then it, what does it say? It says that he took the man and he breathed the breath of life in him and he became a living being. Look it up in Genesis 1 and 2. 
the breath of God, the spirit of God was placed into human beings in the beginning. So that we see the spirit's work right here at creation. We're given breath. Then we see the fall where we are disconnected from from God, we're dis- disconnected from the spirit of life. Stay with me. And then the, the story of redemption starts to unfold, being culminated in Jesus' work, his ministry, his incarnation, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Hallelujah. And then after that, what happens? Is the story over? No. It tells us that Jesus appeared before his disciples, convinced them that he had raised from the dead. And then what he tell them? He said, go to Jerusalem and wait until the gift my father has promised comes. I need to ascend and sit down at his right hand. And when I do that, I am pouring out the comforter, the helper, and he is going to fill you and fuel you and give you the life that you can't have for yourself. And so this is the story of Pentecost, where it goes into the gospel. And the gospel continues... In Pentecost, where Jesus pours out his spirit on the church. And then ultimately, this this is the space that we are in right now, looking forward to the day that Jesus returns and puts all things under his feet and puts the world fully to right. But here's the deal. The church has been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit unto this day. Not only as a deposit, but as the number one agent to help us call more people to come into the kingdom of God. N.T. Wright said it like this, the spirit is given to begin the work of making God's future real in the present. Oh, baby, let me say that again. I should have wrote it down. The spirit is given to begin the work of making God's future real in the present. So we don't actually have to wait to get to heaven to experience the joy of heaven or the peace of heaven or the power of heaven. He has come in the spirit. Do we want to see heaven on earth? Absolutely. We look forward to this day, the second coming, the new creation. Go back and read, go back and check out the Revelation series. We'll talk about it. But in the meantime, we have the Holy Spirit who empowers us and protects us and brings us and will bring us to that day. This is the work of the spirit. So put quite simply, the spirit of God is the secret and the source to life in the here and now. Oh, that's such a big statement. Y'all looking at me like, oh. No, if you want to live the fullness of life, you need the Holy Spirit in you and on you, period. Like, this is why I love this verse, and it gets, it gets used in the wrong context all the time. Paul said to the Ephesians, don't, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What's he talking about? Is this, a, is this slapping people's wrists who drink, or, or is this something more? This is something more. This is don't look to created things to satisfy what only the spirit of the living God can satisfy. So be filled with the spirit. If you want to truly live, you have to be filled with the spirit. Alcohol can't do it. Relationships can't do it. Success and climbing the corporate ladder can't do it. But man, you can be filled with the spirit. So this is how it plays out in your life. I, I, I took the liberty of creating a clip art graph. Oh, baby. Yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> my sister sent me all these, and she's like, what are you going to do with these clips? And here, you, here you have it. Um, I, I thought it might be helpful for some of you, because we're talking about the Holy Spirit and how, you, how it works in your life. What does it look like? Like, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? And, and, and I want to just sort of map it out for you. So the Holy Spirit is at work in every person's life on planet Earth right now simultaneously. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people to believe in Christ in the first place. So there are uh, roughly 2 billion Christians on planet Earth. Well, all, almost 8 billion people are right now under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He's working on everybody to draw us to Jesus. So there's this thing called prevenient grace where God is working to bring all people. So before you got saved, God was working. And some of you can look back and see how. But God was working. And so just word of encouragement to some of you have unbelieving family members or kids and stuff that you're praying for. God is at work in their life. So the Spirit is already at work. So let me just like map out the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
He's already at work in a person's life, pushing them to have an encounter, a, a, a crisis of existential faith where you realize, I can't save myself. I need Jesus to forgive my sins and make me right with God. And this is what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. We call on his name. It says in the book of Romans that if we call on his name, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Such good news. And this is what happens. We're saved when we put our faith in Jesus, not because you did anything right, but because Jesus did everything right and by his free gift of grace. And then when we're saved, as an outward expression of our faith, we're baptized in water. We do this at our church. When we, when we baptize people in water, it's a picture of the new life that you have entered into in Christ Jesus. Now, the Spirit's work is not done when we get here. But a lot of the time, people stall right here. We'll come back to that in a second. So after you believe, you start this journey. And this, you continue, honestly, you continue in the failure of your own strength unless you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes people are immediately filled right after they believe, with, believe in Jesus. But for a lot of us, myself included, I went years and years and years I wasn't taught this. And so it wasn't until after a, a time of seeking and learning that I realized I needed to invite the Holy Spirit into my life. And the Holy Spirit came and performed the baptism of the Holy Spirit where I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the point where I would say that right here, I got all of God. He held nothing back from me. But there was a journey in here where God had to get all of me. And this moment where I surrendered my life fully to him and asked for him to fill me with his spirit, that was a different work than what happened right here. Same God, same grace, same goodness, but a different job. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment. And then after that, my life, and some of you can testify to this, has looked like being led by the Spirit, this growth in grace, where I am daily, monthly, yearly, decadely, is that a word, being drawn out. So it's like the Lord fills you and then draws you out. It's almost like there's an ebb and a flow to this relationship with God and you get drawn out and then you have this fresh filling. And then you go through another season where a pandemic hits and all your plans get thrown out the window and you just want to quit everything. That's you, not me. <laughs> and then you realize, I need a fresh filling. I'm dry, I'm cracked, I'm stretched, I'm thin. I need more of the, the Spirit in my life. And you need to understand, these plateau moments are part of the process. It's so God can draw us out and stretch us out and push our roots of faith and obedience down deeper. If you have had a moment in the last two years, you say, you know what, I don't feel it, but I'm not turning back. Where else would I go? Your roots are driving in deeper. And what happens is that dryness causes your roots to go down deeper in preparation for another fresh filling. And this journey happens all the way until you either die and you get glorified in perfection with God forever or Christ returns and we will be clothed in glory. Either way, this journey continues. The ebb and flow of growth in grace. Now, why, why, do, I, why do I lay this out? Because... Two problems we face. A lot of people get stalled right here. And depending on your tradition, there are whole traditions. Let me just say this in fear and trembling. There are whole traditions that are stalled. Because they are operating apart from the invitation and partnership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be welcomed into your life before you start to see this. This is why, like me and like Lisa, you don't have security to know whose you are. It's not until this comes, this work of grace. This is why you, you don't see any transformation happening in your life because you can be saved but still operating under your own power. You can. But when the Spirit comes... We start growth. So we get in trouble here, a lot of people, or if this ebb takes too long, some of us 
all too easily can start to normalize the plateaued life, start to doubt that this ever actually happened, and our standards start to drop, and we slowly and subtly start to live life apart from the Spirit. We just become a believer who is powerless. This is the problem that we have as believers. The problem is many believers try to live the Christian life apart from the indwelling and empowering of the Spirit of God, resulting in cycles of insecurity, immorality, failure, frustration, bondage, stagnation, and idolatry. Without the Spirit of God at work in your life, this is, the, this is where you end up. And maybe some of you have always only actually been there. Or maybe some of you are, are finding yourself there now. Either way, whether you need a first filling or a fresh filling, you need to be filled with the Spirit. Without the Spirit's engagement in the life, in your life, you are destined for failure. It's impossible to live the Christian life apart from his presence. I don't know how many times I need to hear that or read it from the words of Jesus before I really believe it. Like the Greek word um, where Jesus says, apart from me you can do nothing, the Greek word for nothing is nothing. No exceptions. You can't. It's a losing battle. The battle for identity. You know, some of you, you resonate with the am I saved. Every time you have a bad day or you fail or you, you, you fall short, what do you do? You're like, you, you go, you don't just ask for forgiveness, you ask for salvation because you aren't sure if you die you're going to go to heaven. This is why I got saved so many times as an adolescent because I wasn't sure. This is why, let me say this in love, this is why there are folks in our church congregation who keep getting baptized because you think that your baptism in water is somehow going to do the trick for you. That's not the baptism you need. If you've been baptized, that's great. Now you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit so you have the assurance that what happened when you put your faith in Jesus is real. You'll struggle with your morality. You'll struggle with your identity. I love it, Romans 8. I could, I could hear this when Lisa was sharing her testimony. Romans 8 says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you don't feel like you're a child of God, you need the work of the Spirit in your life. We'll struggle with our morality. You'll struggle with sin. The Bible says, though, that the Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Philippians says, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. If you want to live a life of victory, it's not by trying harder. Just take a deep breath and, and exhale. God does not expect you to live perfect. He expects his presence to fill you and draw you and lead you and transform you into his image. What a beautiful invitation. So some of you who grew up in maybe legalistic backgrounds where you got to do better, you got you to you know, do certain things, you can't eat, smoke, drink, or chew and go with girls who do. Right? And you have this kind of do better mentality. That's not the invitation of the Holy Spirit. The invitation is love Jesus, abide in me, and watch me change your world. Whew. So freeing. That's why Jesus said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what's not easy and light is being like Jesus unless Jesus is in you. It's easy for Him. Not for you, not for me. It's his presence that brings transformation. It's his presence that brings peace. Some of us in the Christian context, some of us in the family of God, struggle with anxiety pervasively. It's not just a sin, it's a tragedy that you are that afraid of what could happen tomorrow. When the Spirit of God fills you, you are filled with peace and security and confidence knowing I know whose I am. I know where I'm going. I know he's good and he's causing all things to come together for my good. So even if that happened or this happened or this might happen, I'm good because God is good and he's in me. He brings us to life. This is the problem 
We try to live the life without him. But here's the promise, and this is really where I want to land today. The promise of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say concerning the Holy Spirit? Well, first, I've been hitting on this. He said, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Your simple prayer, if you want victory, if you want peace, if you want satisfaction, you want provision, you want all, it's you want the Holy Spirit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He said it is better. He said this to his disciples, not just in the first century, but to y'all. He said, it is better that I leave so I can send you the helper, the gift my father promised. Can you imagine the disciples when they heard that? Like, can you imagine like just Jesus in the body, just doing life with you every day, how great that would be? And yet Jesus himself said, it's actually better that I leave because I won't just be near you, I'll be in you. The gift of the spirit, the gift his father promised. Jesus directed the disciples, he said, wait until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't try to do this without the power of the Spirit in your life. You're better off just sitting and waiting in a room until the Spirit comes. And then when the Spirit comes, you can go into all the earth and make disciples. You need the Spirit. But here's, here's the big thing, the promise. Jesus said, seek and you will find, ask and the Holy Spirit will be given to you. He promised us. He promised us. God wants to give you a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, and I say this in love and invitation, just feel the invitation of the Spirit. There's no condemnation. There's no second-class Christians. It's just God is inviting you to experience him in a way that you've never experienced. And you will come to life in a way you've never been alive. This is the promise of the Spirit. Who am I talking to? Some of you who need a, fresh bapti a first baptism. Here's how you can know if you've never had a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that you're saved? Uh, are you any different than you were before you met Jesus? Or are you the same? Uh, have you had an encounter or an experience with God's presence where you knew his tangible presence was coming around you and flowing up from within you? If, if you can't answer yes, or if, you, if this is you, then you need a first baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's the good news. God wants to give this to you. Just hear it. Just hear that. Like, that's for you. you. There's an invitation. Or some of you, do I need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit? Not a first, but a fresh. Have you been stretched lately? Felt that. Broken. Emptied. Under pressure. Are you operating out of a deficit and you feel like there's just not enough of you to meet the needs that are around you? Anybody? Am I preaching anyone's language right now? Speak, yeah. That, that has been me for months. Are you finding life with Christ and life in general a struggle? If yes, you need a fresh baptism. A fresh baptism, not a first. A fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's the good news. God wants to give that for you. I just want to declare today over us, King's Church, this. There is a fresh appointment with the King of Kings, the Holy Spirit, with your name on it. Like everybody under the sound of my voice, there is an encounter with the Holy Spirit with your name on it, especially those of you who have never experienced it before, and especially those of you who, like me, have gone through a season of dryness and flatness. Um, I was telling you a few minutes ago, I'd, I'd tell you my recent infilling and baptism of the Spirit. Um, in January of this year, I had a dream. And I don't dream very much. I'm a terrible sleeper. I have been my whole life, but I don't have many dreams. And when I do, they're usually like very clear, very vivid, and game-changing. I had a dream. I'd never experienced anything like this before where I was actually in the story in John chapter 21 where Jesus comes along the beach and the disciples are in the boat fishing all night and catching nothing. You know the story? And I'm telling you, it was a visceral experience where I'm in this boat living out a Bible story right, right in it. It was really interesting. And we're fishing all night, pulling up empty nets all night, just empty, 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 empty. And then Jesus comes along the beach and he says, hey, try the other side. And we throw the net over to the other side and we pull in just this overflowing catch. And the joy that came with the fullness was very palpable in that moment. And then I wake up and I've heard the Lord say, 
there's coming a moment when I will say the word to you and you will be full again. I felt it was an invitation for me and an invitation to our church. And I'm not saying that numerically, like we'll be full again. I mean full again to overflowing. And out of that moment, I, I settled in, I rested in that word, and I settled into a time of seeking. Really just waiting is all it took for me. Just I know I have an appointment coming. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like. I just know God is going to fill me fresh when he says the word. And so uh, a week ago, my wife and I went to England, uh, and we were there at Holy Trinity Brompton with the good people of Alpha. And uh, I was at a gathering on a Tuesday morning, and I was still quite numb and stretched. And even some of you know that feeling right now. You're a little numb to what I'm saying. And we're in this gathering, and it's just the most beautiful time. The Spirit of God was just moving, and Nicky Gumbel gets up, and he starts to minister, and he prays that the Holy Spirit would just convince us deeper of the love of Christ for us. And I'm standing right there around people. People are getting blessed and just touched. My wife is just having this moment with Jesus that I've been praying she would have, and she's just experiencing it. But I'm just sort of sitting there thinking, yeah, good. But I'm still dry. Still empty. He hadn't said the word over me yet. Uh, my wife went off and did her thing that afternoon. I was in another meeting. And uh, their, their pastor that I would call their Dan Lamus, who has been stewarding their prayer ministry for some like 30 years, was leading a session. And he, he invited the Holy Spirit to come. And he invited us to just stand and open our hands. And he said, I have a vision in my mind right now of one of you who you have been like you're in the boat throwing a net and you're pulling in emptiness. <laughs> if you don't, like, I am dull, right? There, but that was clear. And he said, um, he said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use this language, but you are depressed and wounded. And he said, depression... God is taking that off of you right now. And I felt a tangible weight just go. Whoa. And he said, and God is closing up open wounds. And I felt just this wholeness come around me. But God wasn't even done there. He'd said the word and then um, Thursday we're at Oxford, Oxford. And... Um, we're in a thousand-year-old church, the same church where George Whitfield and John Wesley got gripped by the Spirit and, and went off and brought, through God through them, brought the, the Great Awakening. And we bow down on our knees and we just ask the Holy Spirit to come. And I was filled fresh. <laughs> just like to, I was full again. Just joy and peace and possibility and power. I wanted to do ministry again. That's a miracle, y'all. Um, energy. He said the word over me, and I'm full for this season. And that's what I believe God wants for you. I hear the word of the Lord. There is an appointment with your name on it. This is not some special thing for special people. I'm not any more special than you are. This is the gift that God wants to give you. Because Jesus gave his life, not just so that you could die and go to heaven someday, but the very living presence, the breath, the ruach of God could live inside of you, fill your lungs, your soul up with his presence, wash over you fresh, cleanse you. Just last night I was talking to my son about one conference and he was saying, like, I experienced God. He said, uh, I felt clean. You do. There's a cleanliness 
and a restoration that the Spirit does in you that you can't manufacture. And no amount of good deeds or behavior modification will ever convince your soul that you're clean. But one touch from the presence of God, things that were unclean become clean. And things that were dead become alive. And things that were lost become found. And blindness becomes sight. And mourning turns into joy. That's what happens when the Spirit comes. So my prayer for us today is that we would settle in to a time where we would rest and wait on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Here's your next step for today. I'm not actually going to pray right now that the Spirit comes and fills you. I, I want you to start asking the Lord, Lord, do you have this for me? And I actually want to set you up into a season of seeking. I mean, right now we could stop and we could pray and ask the Spirit to come, and He probably would, but I actually feel there's, a, there's something God wants to do in some of you that you just... You shift and you wait for your moment when, when God says the word and fullness comes. And I just, I feel in the deep fibers of my, this is the spirit of God speaking through me. He has a moment with your name on it. And I don't know when or where or how, but there is a moment coming where you will be brought to life in a way that you can never manufacture yourself. So here's a few things. <laughs> First, you need to recognize that the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is what you need. Hear the word of the Lord. You don't need a nicer house or a new car or a, or a new job or a new spouse or whatever. He is who you need. Realize there is nothing more that God wants to do for you than give you more of himself. In this seeking, you don't have to ask God to do something he's not already dying or died to do. He wants to give you his spirit. It's his pleasure. Rest in the fact that he promised he would give us himself if we seek him. And resolve to wait on a fresh filling of the spirit of God, trusting him with the where, when, and how. Would you stand to your feet? All of our locations, I want to pray. I'm going to pray a prayer of hunger over you. And a prayer of appointment. You might not have a dream where you're in the disciples' boat. God's going to speak to you in your own language and he's going to set it up in your own experience. But I, I just want to say over you, King's Church, there is a moment coming where God says the word and fullness will be yours. Some of you have never experienced it before and some of you it's been a long time Either way, God wants to do this for you. So if that's you, I just want you to bow your heads wherever you are and just open your hands up in a posture of surrender and openness. And we now say, God, hear us as the church, hear us as King's church, hear us as sons and daughters. We recognize we need you. Lord, some of us, we've never experienced your presence and we need you. And more of us, God, I have the sense that we're dry and parched and hurt and wounded, afraid, depressed. And God, we just say, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. Father, I pray today for everyone under the sound of my voice that they would connect their dryness to an invitation to be filled fresh with the living water that comes from your spirit. God, help us seek you and rest in you in this season and do a mighty work in us, God, that can't be explained away, that is the unmistakable seal and power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. We say, come Holy Spirit, have your way in your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, and amen.